Today we'll be talking about mining non-renewable mineral resources. This is an important topic because it's basically how and where we get the minerals that make up everything in our daily lives. All of our conveniences, all of our ways of life, all depend on mineral resources. The things we have comes from the earth. And we have to locate, mine, and extract, and then process those minerals and make them into the things that we use every day. This is something we take for granted. All right, we soon forget the things that aren't visible in our lives. It's an out of sight, out of mind type issue. But it's very important to understand this topic, um, and especially how it relates to the environment. So in regards to mining, mining is somewhat of a paradox. Uh, this is a tough one, because we know that there's a huge environmental cost but we absolutely need the things that we have and use. So mining is something that's so environmentally destructive, yet it's, it's fueling our future. All of our technologies, all of our modern day conveniences, our transportations, everything relies on mining the minerals and non-renewable resources we need. So throughout this lecture, and as you tr internalize the environmental impact of this industry, you know, just keep in mind that it's it's somewhat of a paradox because we need to do this. All right, so you'll see, hopefully, the importance of things like recycling and keeping those minerals that are able to be recycled into the materials economy. All right, so there's less of a need to mine new minerals. You're always going to have mining, and you're always going to need new minerals, but let's keep the ones in the system that we already have so that we can reuse them. You'll see through the environmental impacts that we need to regulate, monitor, and hopefully minimize the environmental impacts of mining. Since the environmental impacts are so great, and they're usually in environmentally sensitive areas or near, near people, there's going to be a need to reduce those impacts. All right, impacts on things like ecosystems and diversity, you know, both land and aquatic. Impacts on water and groundwater impacts on the atmosphere and human health. Okay, so this lecture is going to focus on the environmental impacts of mining, but you have to remember that these things all happen while providing us with everything we have. Everything from our energy needs to the technology in our hands, all the electronics that we've come to rely on, the wiring, the capacitors, the processors, the jewelry that we wear, the cars and the planes and our transportation, the need for especially things like rare earth metals has been on the increase in the last decade or two, especially as mobile phone industry has exploded, okay, and things are getting smaller and more available. We just need to remember that all these things that we're going to talk about today, from tantalum to coal, all come from the ground. They all come from the earth. All right, you have to remember that. And there's impacts, environmental impacts, of locating and extracting and processing these ores and minerals. And that's what we're going to get into. The global production of rare earth metals has increased, like I said, but it's the country of China where it has really exploded which is where most of our electronics are made and produced so the need for these things in China has greatly increased over the years and if you look here in other countries not so much but China because of that huge demand is putting a stress on our planet in the mining industry so here's where a lot of the need for these things comes from Let's start here with the types of mining. The first one is to literally dig. All right, there's a couple different terms and methods for that. Artisanal mining or small scale mining is where we're going to start here. And another type of surface mining that's more primitive is called placer mining. And that's where you can picture people panning for gold or dredging in a stream bed or an alluvial fan deposit, which, which is basically just gravel and soil. But to literally dig is a very primitive and 
energy intensive process with this type of mining I'm going to bring up the world of conflict minerals I think this is something that everybody should be aware of and one of the most famous places where this is happening is in the Democratic Republic of Congo and that's going to be our case study here for this uh, type of mining so let's go through this real quick and here's just a couple of pictures of what we're talking about here literally panning small-scale operations the DRC is very poor um, they've been ravaged by war and corruption and these people make very little money during the day they're stuck in these positions where they have to work very very hard all day for for little wage if any um, and sometimes they're provided with food and in the top left there that's what we're looking for we're looking for these rare earth metals that are used in today's electronics so which ones are we looking for here in the Democratic Republic of Congo? You can look at this chart and think of it as the three TG minerals. All right, that's a nice way to remember this. And what I'm talking about is tin, tantalum, tungsten, and gold. And if you look here, tin, tantalum, tungsten, and gold, one common theme throughout all four of these metals are electronics. Okay. And in fact, it's the number one use for three out of the four, where the number one use for gold is jewelry. But all four of these metals we use all over the place in our society, um, in transportation, uh, medical application, uh, lighting in, in regards to tungsten, and jewelry in, in, with gold. But very, very, very useful metals. And let's talk a little bit about tantalum. Tantalum is extremely corrosion resistant. All right, It's very, very rare but it's a nice substitute for platinum and tantalum is used in your iPhone and your smartphone as a capacitor and you know if you have an iPhone or a smartphone in your pocket most likely carrying a little piece of the Congo with you every day it's inert and just extremely useful in in electronics and take a look at this column here all the way to the right and although it's hidden what we're looking at here is the percent of the world's supply in the Congo the Democratic Republic of the Congo so in regards to tantalum there's a lot of tantalum in the Congo and the smuggling and the export of its ore which is Colton uh, has really helped fuel war in the Congo and we'll talk a little bit about that war because what happens is the mines are usually operated by uh, corrupt government officials or even you know military leaders and when they have control over the ore they're the ones overseeing the smuggling of this and and the money that they get is usually used for you know weapons that which fuels further violence so these are the things we want to be aware of so that we can make decisions in our lives to not support these types of activities all right, so the three TG minerals are something to be aware of. There's something to know and to keep in the back of your mind because these are the ones that are so used in society. All right, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is smack dab right in the middle of Africa there in the rainforest belt. And just a quick little history because it is very complicated. There were two Congo Wars. The first Congo War started in, started in and around 1996 to 1997. And then this, what they call the Second Congo War uh, from 1998 to about 2003. But hostilities still continue. All right, there's a very fragile state there right now in regards to government. But both wars, if you combine them, were the deadliest wars in modern African history. So around 5.4 million people died in that about eight-year history. Most of those people died from disease and starvation. Okay, there was mass exodus out of the Congo, all right, and again, it's, it's conflict minerals that were helping the rebels and, and really aiding their, their financial situation where they would take that money and then buy weapons. All right, so take a look down here just to finish this slide here in the bottom right. I like this picture. It was out of a National Geographic article. There's a great article in National Geographic. You know, just take a look at this, this young man's face right here literally just watching the bowl of rice waiting for his spoonful ration uh, for the day probably worked very very hard 
uh, in the mine all day along with this gentleman too. They're just waiting for their spoonful of ration of rice for the day. So just very powerful imagery coming out of the Congo. And I like this too because it shows you down here in the lower left the minerals that we're talking about and where the mines are located. Most of the mines are located along the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of the Congo near the Kivu River. And this geography is important because if you look here where these mines are, it makes it very easy to smuggle the, the ore into places like Rwanda and Uganda and Tanzania. These are the places where you know there's, there's a hookup between local governments and you can smuggle these minerals out into these places and then out into the world. So, so the geography of the Congo becomes very important. All right, and you can also see here the difference between the dense forest and the savanna and where agriculture is occurring. So uh, the lighter blue is actually the dense forest. That's, that's the rainforest. Um, mining operations occur in and around uh, endemic species and endangered species. This is where things like the silverback gorilla, gorilla which is it's a species with very low numbers. So, so there's a clash between economy, military, people and, and the environment in this situation. Very, very ugly situation. More powerful images of what's going on there. All right, we're talking about just kids uh, being forced into these situations. Um, rape is used as a weapon to both intimidate and control. So this is, this is something that we do not want to support we want to make sure that the companies we're buying from are also not supporting con the world of conflict minerals. This is not a place to grow up in. All, right, all this for this. Just for your knowledge, this is something that I found interesting. These are the electronics companies that are ranked by their progress on eliminating conflict minerals from their products. So these green ones at the top are pretty much the companies that we should feel good to support, like HP, Intel, uh, there's a couple other here. Apple has been making strides. Same thing with Microsoft and Dell. All right, But more importantly, which are the companies that we should we should really let them know through consumer choice or even consumer action that is peaceful um, that we know and wish that they would change their ways in regards to conflict minerals companies like Sony, LG, Samsung, Toshiba and if you look down here the camera companies and then this is the one that really say no to alright so so there you go that's a nice little image for you to help you make consumer choices in regards to conflict minerals. Alright, so let's take a look at a second type of mining, a second type of surface mining. Strip mining is a general term for any type of practice of mining where a seam of mineral has been located, but it is under layers of soil and rock, which we're going to call overburden. So in this picture here, you see the overburden is, is up here and that overburden needs to be systematically removed. What we're going to do is we're going to expose the layers of mineral or what we call a seam. All right, and then we're going to systematically remove that seam in a series of strips to extract and process the mineral. Okay, to give you a sense of how this is done, I'm going to draw a nice little diagram here for you. Okay, so we, here we have our environment, and there just so happens that there's a coal seam underground that has been located by a mining company, and they're going to want to go ahead and expose that coal seam and extract it for processing. Okay, so the first thing we need to do, the first step of this process, is to remove the trees. So that deforestation is done by cutting, and then the lumber is usually either sold or burned. Okay, so removal of the trees needs to occur and then we have to remove the overburden. Alright, and we remove the overburden either by drilling or blasting. 
And that overburden is going to become a problem because we need to store that somewhere. When we're finished with this mine, we're going to want to put things back, uh, hopefully as close to the way it was as possible. We call that reclamation. So for the reclamation process, we need to store this overburden so that we can fill our mine back in later. The storing of the overburden usually occurs either off-site, all right, so we're going to either put this stuff off-site, or we're literally going to take the overburden and put it right behind us, and that ends up to be done in a series of steps, which will create a, a, literally a man-made mountain behind you. So then later, you can take that mountain and just refill your hole. Now we've exposed the coal seam, the mineral itself, so we're literally going to excavate that mineral and load it onto trucks, sometimes trains, to transport for processing. Okay, so it's as easy as that, but you can already think of some of the environmental impacts of this, okay? The deforestation, the problem of the overburden, where you're going to expose soil and rock and put it into a pile, and what they're going to do is they're going to step this on slight angles to basically stabilize it so it doesn't collapse. All right, so you'll see that uh, when you see pictures of, of strip mining. They actually have a name for that. The steps, the flat part, are called benches, and the angled part are called batter. All right, and then we call the series of them steps. All right, so the benches, the batter, make up the steps, and then those, that process, that procedure helps contain rock falls. Okay, sometimes you need additional ground support, uh, things like rock bolts, cable bolts. If I go back a slide here, you can see the series of steps, benches, and the batter. And there's roads built within those to take the ore from the bottom of the mine where it's being excavated and take it away. So we'll excavate these seams until either the mineral is exhausted or the ratio of overburden to ore makes further mining e uneconomic. Okay, here's just another picture of what we drew. And you can pause this and read this through if you'd like. All right, we get a lot of our, our non-renewable minerals through strip mining. All right, aluminum is a nice example. And I mean non-renewable, and some of you might be thinking, well, you can recycle it, and that's true. It's renewable in that way. When I say non-renewable, I'm talking about there's only so much aluminum on the planet. And when we exhaust that amount, that's it. It's non-renewable. We can keep aluminum in the materials economy through recycling, and that's what makes recycling so important. So if, if, if we're thinking in a sustainable way, if we want our future generations to have the same conveniences and things that we have today, we need to make sure that they have aluminum in the future. So we need to make sure we mine less, which means recycling more. Okay, so that's the importance of recycling and what it means to be non-renewable. The only things that are renewable are things like sunlight, water, wind, things that are always going to be there. They're constant. And we'll talk about renewable energy sources, but I need you to know the difference of non-renewable and renewable. So aluminum is a non-renewable mineral resource, which is extremely common on the surface of the earth. It has a tremendous weight to strength ratio, and that's what makes it so nice and useful. All right? It's durable. It has ancient uses, going all the way back to the ancient Egyptians. And the most important thing in my mind is that it is recyclable. All right, we can keep this in the materials economy, which makes it really nice and cost effective for companies. And just so you know, aluminum comes from the ore bauxite. And then they need to take the aluminum out of that ore. And that's what the processing is all about. But when you process that, we want to get out the pure aluminum and they make things called ingots. All right, ingot is a general term for a metal that has been put in some form. In the case of aluminum, the ingots are these like sectioned pieces of raw aluminum. So these will then go off to be processed and into the products that we need and use like aluminum cans. Here are a bunch of the, m the more important mineral resources we have. 
and you can see uh, in 2004 the production of these things in thousands of metric tons. All right, so let's compare here. Here you go for aluminum. Uh, copper is another important mineral resource. Phosphate rock is mined for fertilizer. All right, obviously iron, and then you got zinc. But take a look at these numbers. When you look at the amount of copper being mined um, in 2004 alone and compare that to the amount of zinc, we're using and consuming zinc at a high rate. And then you go down to the bottom chart here and you ask yourself how much zinc is left and you get a little nervous when you see that it's been estimated of 22 years of supply of zinc so in our lifetime there might be a crisis with with the amount of zinc in the world and you know you look at this too you, you know this this one is is somewhat concerning too because you think about the amount of copper that we use in our wiring and electronics all right so we're going to need to find substitutes or really step up our recycling of these types of products okay aluminum like I said is very common and then you take a look at iron and nickel as well so here's a picture of a strip mine all right they load the overburden or the mineral onto these conveyor belts and things are separated and what needs to be disposed of goes on piles and what needs to go to processing goes somewhere else All right, to truck or train. Moving along here a third type of surface mine is called an open pit mine and you'll see pictures of these things they're absolutely gigantic. It is a form of strip mining because you see the benches and the the batter which make up the steps that go all the way down deep into the earth which has exposed uh, mineral ore which is extracted and then off to processing so these open pit mines are basically techniques to mine mineral deposits that are close to the surface but they resemble pits rather than stripped earth All right, so think about the amount of overburden think about the amount of waste rock Okay, which is all piled up either nearby or off-site. Right, there's a lot of piles of material. Here's what's called a tailings pile. Tailings is a, is a general term for ore that's been processed and piled up nearby, and that becomes an environmental problem as well. But let me introduce the word tailings pile here. All right, but these open mines are huge. You can see the scale here but by the size of those trucks, which are the largest trucks in the world, and they are dwarfed at this scale. Okay, here's another one. This is a bauxite mine. You can see the copper color in the rock on the side of the face of the, of the open pit mine. Just huge, huge operations. Down here in the lower right, you see some of the tailings piles. All right, some of the piles of stuff left over from the processing of ore. Okay, but you wonder where has that all that overburden gone? All right, these copper mines are extremely important because we use copper everywhere in our lives. Extracted from the ore calco pyrite. And some of you might see or know pyrite as being fool's gold so that's you know that that's a metal in this case calcopyrite is the ore of copper but you know copper is very ductile you can mold it it's extremely useful because it has high conductivity which makes it useful in electronics okay it's actually essential to all living organisms so it's put in things like vitamins all right it's a trace dietary mineral all right it's actually used in the respiration process of our muscles and bones it's also found in our liver again we use it in electronics wiring architecture uh, there's other antimicrobial applications so copper is extremely useful in today's society which makes it in demand all right, so where do we find copper? Where's the mining going on? Large amounts of copper are coming out of the country Chile, okay, in Peru, China, and the United States, among other countries. But Chile by far leads the world in the recovery and production of copper. Okay, a nice case study here is called the Pasca Llama Project in Chile. 
This open pit mine operation is not currently in production. It is kind of on hold. It's on the back burner. This project is being planned to mine gold, silver, and copper in Chile at the border of Argentina and Chile. If you notice here, the, the project is, is pretty expansive and controversial project because of its close proximity to glaciers. If you look at this map here, there's at least four glaciers that are that are pretty close proximity that would be impacted by this project. So the controversy behind this project is all about glaciers, but it also has the potential to impact the water supply for up to 70,000 farmers that are in and around the area that rely on both the glaciers and groundwater for, for agricultural purposes. This mine also has the potential to re release things like cyanide, mercury, sulfuric acid into rivers. But projects like this provide jobs, and that goes a long way. So the project has, re has not been approved by the government of Chile. There's a lot of controversy behind this project. There's also a lot of struggle to find the funding to pursue this project. All right, so it's, it's on the back burner as of right now. Argentina is in full support of this project, but Chile is a little bit more hesitant uh, due to the environmental impact that it's, it's rumored to have. They've gone so far as to say that the, the glacier, that the glaciers they will impact, they can actually relocate them. And if they're going to impact a the glacier, they'll take what they're going to impact and move it and add it to another glacier. And you know, you can be the judge of whether you think that would be a good idea or not. But that was one of the solutions to the problem to actually move a glacier. But what the Pascua Llama project gives us is a case study in uh, some of the challenges and impacts that that mines might have in other places of the world. Um, and it also shows us that these things are usually placed in environmentally sensitive areas, in this case, near glaciers. All right, allow me to continue with another case study, the Pascua Llama project in Chile. All right, this open pit mine is uh, famous for its gold. This open pit mine is currently in production. Um, they, there's mining of gold, copper, and silver this particular operation. Uh, it's located in the Andes Mountains in the southern reaches of the Atacama Desert. There's high controversy with this one and if you look at the picture here to the left uh, it, it has a close proximity to a lot of glaciers and that's what makes it uh, a controversial project. All right, glaciers are obviously declining on Earth as we move into the era of global warming. So, you know, what, what, what this project is, what makes people nervous about this project is that it may, it may cause the melting of glaciers. And with it, it will literally decrease the amount of water available to around an estimated 70,000 local farmers of this region. All right, so you can see that farming is a huge industry in this part of the world. Um, uh, these open pit mines are also known to release things like cyanide, mercury, and other like sulfide and sulfuric acid. I spelled that wrong, um, directly into rivers. Alright, but on the other hand, the argument is that this project will provide jobs. Okay, so so this Pascua Llama project in Chile is, is very controversial because of its relationship to glaciers. It's in a, as, as 
as is the case with a lot of open pit mines and strip mining, uh, they find themselves in environmentally sensitive areas. And that's where these mineral resources are. So it's, uh, again, it's a tough one. Okay, we need copper, we need gold and silver. And, you know, the cost of it, the environmental cost may be glaciers in this case and, and water. Okay, so that's another case study for you. Here's another open pit mine. You might see a little bit difference in this one from the other ones that we've been looking at. You might see straight walls. Open pit mines for building materials or stone are called quarries. And I happen to grow up around quarries my entire life. All right, this is the town of Nazareth, Pennsylvania. And just next to Nazareth is a town called Northampton. And if you went to North, if you went to Nazareth, you were a Blue Eagle. If you went to Northampton, you were a concrete kid, because in this area of the world, there under, underground is called the limestone belt, and an open pit mine that mines building materials like limestone. All right, is called a quarry. So this is a limestone quarry, and I used to own a house, basically right here. Right, so if you walked out my backyard, you would fall into a limestone quarry. So you see a quarry here. You see a large quarry operation here that's filled with water, so that's obviously expired. This area of this quarry is filled with water, so that's obviously expired. But you see these large, giant operations still continuing um, in, in my hometown. And what they do is they pump the water out so that excavation can continue. And this is just a, this is on the one side of the town. There's an identical series of quarries on the other side of town, and that's just in Nazareth. Northampton has a whole bunch as well. So limestone is mined and crushed and produced into cement. So a lot of the world's cement for building comes from the Nazareth Northampton area in the limestone belt of eastern Pennsylvania. And here's a Google image of the area, and our limestone belt is about right here, underground. Limestone is literally calcium carbonate, CaCO3, which is a layer of dead ocean critters that's been piled up and turned to stone. So this part of the world was a shallow ocean environment for millions and millions of years, which is why we have underground limestone today. And just so your bearings are correct, Souderton is down in this district right here um, in Montgomery County. But interestingly enough, just north of Nazareth is another underground belt. And this one's a little different. Not limestone, but slate. And the area of Penargel and Bangor, Pennsylvania is right dead center in the middle of the slate belt. So a lot of the country's cement comes from the limestone belt and a lot of the country's slate comes from the slate belt and we use slate for many different things it's a building material we used to use it for sh roofing shingles things like that okay so very interesting local history there all right here's a slate overburden or tailings pile uh, right next to a baseball field in Penargel, Pennsylvania and those pieces of slate that are on that pile are gigantic you would not be able to lift one of those up it's bigger than a table, all right, and that's a huge, huge pile, one of many. Here's another picture of, of a quarry that's been decommissioned and is now filled with water. Okay, the fourth type of surface mine is called mountaintop removal. Pretty self-explanatory, mountaintop removal is just that. Remove a mountaintop to expose a seam or a mineral deposit for extraction and processing for the mineral itself. All right, this one is very also very controversial because it is the most environmentally destructive process of the mining industry. To literally take a mountain away has tremendous environmental impacts. However, the coal business says that this method is safer and cheaper than subsurface mining, digging t tunnels and shafts and it's more economically feasible. Alright, our case study to talk about mountaintop removal is Appalachia 
in the states of mostly West Virginia, Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. In this area of the world, there's over 500 total mountaintop removal projects, and it's nearly 1.2 million acres, an area almost as large as Delaware, have been heavily mined in this way. So let's talk about this a little bit and the process involved. Okay, again, the first step here is to remove the trees on this mountain. So you're immediately going to impact biodiversity and land ecosystems. All right, and when you remove when you remove those trees and that land, you have to put it somewhere. So one of the more controversial things to do with it is to literally fill a valley. All right, so nearby a mountain, you're going to have a stream which downcut a valley. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the top of the mountain off to expose, in this case, coal. And we're going to fill this nearby valley with the material. And we call that a valley fill. All right, and that's controversial because a stream is going through here with aquatic ecosystems and a lot of biodiversity relying on that stream. And we're literally going to fill it in. And we're going to kill everything that relies on that uh, water source. All right, so if you look down here on step number two, we've now removed that mountain and created um, an area where we can access that coal seam. Okay, so mountaintop removal is literally a type of strip mining. So what we're going to do is begin the mining process and backfill, continuously taking the mineral and backfilling. So if you go down here to the next stage here, we're mining the mineral, which are these numbers, and we're we're extracting the ore and taking it off the processing and any tailings or overburden we're just going to put right behind us so that when we're finished here you go you just have a big pile of unwanted stuff in place of the mineral that you took okay so hopefully that makes sense let's look at a couple of pictures here to give you some imagery all right, here you go. You can see how environmentally destructive this actually is. They're literally removing the mountain. And any ecosystem that was once there or any species that relied on this is now gone. Okay, but again, this is a tough one. Mountaintop removal in West Virginia, Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee is done for coal, which provides about 50% of the electricity generated in the United States. All right, so coal is in great demand here in the United States. We're still relying on burning coal to generate our electricity. So what we can do as citizens lessen our electricity use. All right? Turning off your lights when you when you leave a room it is literally helpful. All right. Historically underground coal mining was the leading method but since the use of explosives and heavy machinery uh, became more readily available you can excavate two and a half times more coal per hour with less manpower using methods like mountaintop removal and strip mining. All right, so the industry itself saw the number of jobs decline by 60% uh, from 1979 to 2006. In, in a seven year period in the 90s, we saw 10,000 jobs lost just in that seven, period, seven year period. Coal mining does have a deep history in the United States and it has very close political ties. So there's a lot of supporters of this type of procedure, mountaintop removal and strip mining of coal, and it gets a lot of political backing, which helps the industry. All right, but it is very environmentally destructive. So even though there are protesters, um, a lot of times the environment suffers when it comes to especially mountaintop removal. Let's go through the environmental impacts of mountaintop removal, but also all surface mining. All right. The first one is valley fill. Companies used to have a free reign to just move overburden into uh, valleys nearby the mine, which would literally bury the streams and impact land and aquatic ecosystems. That has since been made illegal companies now need permits to do that because we have to be careful not to violate the Clean Water Act. Um, it still happens, however. The government does grant permits. As recently as 2008, the Bush administration was working very hard to 
loosen these restrictions to allow coal companies and mountaintop removal operations to to continue to fill valleys and if you look here at the next picture um, you see what I mean when you literally just take that overburden and waste and fill a valley all right and the stream has now dried up all right a second direct environmental impact of mining is the sludge or the slurry which we put in things called surface impoundments okay surface impoundment is a man-made pond to store uh, that sludge or slurry that mixture of water and mining byproducts all right the stuff left over from processing that stuff that sludge and slurry becomes toxic and when it's stored in surface ponds you can predict there's a chance that it will flood or the the walls holding the surface impoundment might break and release that into the environment it may seep into the groundwater all right it could also literally evaporate which is what they want it to do they want the water to evaporate and the toxic byproduct to be left behind so that they can scrape it up and dispose of it as hazardous waste however more than not it will find its way into the groundwater supply and poison local uh, groundwater supplies drinking water supplies so this is uh, this is what we do all right you have this byproduct of the mining industry and you know we need to do something with it and surface impoundment is is one of the things we do All right. A third environmental impact is acid mine drainage. A very important one. Acid mine drainage or acid mine runoff is a result from the tailing piles that are piled up nearby the mine. And when any type of sulfide material interacts with water, it it becomes toxic. All right, it becomes highly acidic. And that stuff can flow into our creeks and streams. It could leak into the groundwater. It becomes very it becomes a very dangerous situation so this is how local streams to mining operations become poisoned and damaged um, this happens a lot in Pennsylvania a lot of our creeks and streams have been damaged from acid mine runoff so this one in particular gets an asterisk because it's a huge problem where uh, sulfide materials make streams too acidic for life and the ecosystems are damaged All right, there are some solutions and here's one Here's one that's in the development phase right now. Um, you have a tailings pile where contaminated water is leaking into the groundwater table. And what they're going to do is they're going to build a, a porous wall and they're going to use microbes to filter or neutralize the, the highly acidic contaminated water. All right, and those microbes act as a neutralizer. And there's a, a couple of different things that you can use as a neutralizer. Lime is one of them. Um, but the remediated water, the idea is that as it passes through this barrier, the remediated water on the other side is cleaner than the contaminated water um, from the mine tailings. So that's just one example of something that uh, is a solution to the problem of acid mine runoff using these sulfate reducing microbes. All right. The other things you could do, you can, you, you can use constructed wetlands there's other commercial processes but you know you can see how nature and ecological services it provides is a solution for what for this problem All right, here you go here's some pictures of acid mine runoff and you'll always know a stream that has been damaged by acid mine runoff by that copper brown color All right, if you see that in a creek or a stream it's been impacted by acid mine drainage All right, and again this is a big problem in Pennsylvania Okay, a fourth environmental impact is through the smelting process. And smelt smelting is the process to extract metals from ore, which involves things like heating, melting, uh, chemical baths. All right, smelting is very energy intensive. All right, it produces a lot of waste, um, some of which is called slag. All right, um, it's a source of air pollution things like sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide it's nasty stuff okay and then there's also the chance for exposure to heavy metals 
especially for those who work in the industry who are who are doing the smelting. So I put a couple pictures here. This is obviously iron. All right, they're melting the ore to get the iron out. And then in the top left here, you see this is a giant furnace where they're where they're smelting some mineral, uh, trying to extract the metal from the ore. Okay, a fifth direct impact is obviously habitat destruction. When you take away a habitat, you've destroyed it. Uh, you've impacted basically everything around it. So habitat destruction is somewhat of an obvious impact of mountaintop removal and mining and other open pit mines and strip mines. Uh, what, what becomes dangerous is when these operations are in and around endemic species and endangered species and, and that becomes a huge problem. And the last direct environmental impact that I have to, to talk about is called reclamation. And that has to do with restoring the area to what we're going to call the pre-mine condition. We're going to try and get it back to what it once was or to a stable condition. All right? And that's where the law comes in because there's a 1977 Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. Mining companies are required to restore the area around the mine and the surrounding environment to their pre-mine condition or at least a stable condition when they shut down the mine. And that second provision there becomes extremely important because when you take a mountain away and put it back, it's very difficult to restore that area to pre-mine condition. So what we see is in these reclamation product projects, we see areas that have been reclaimed or repurposed. And if you look at this picture very closely, you'll see the mountain top has been removed and a golf course has been developed. Here's another version where a forest and a mountain used to be. The reclamation process in these two cases have both failed. The companies usually use non-native tree species or non-native grasses and try and plant those species on soils that have been not only moved but depleted of natural minerals. So the soils that are left behind are very poor quality and the grasses have trouble growing. So the reclamation process becomes a direct environmental impact. I have this slide here and, and you might want to do this. It's just something, it's just an interesting exercise. There's a website uh, ilovemountains.org and you can type in your zip code to find out if your if your energy company supports mountaintop removal and what I did was I entered my zip code and mine actually did you are connected to mountaintop removal my electricity provider PPNL is owned by the Southern Union Company which buys coal from companies engaged in mountaintop removal it's not the only place they get coal from these companies get coal from all kinds of different places but one of the places uh, is engaged in mountaintop removal. So that just gives me that much more reason to turn off my lights, unplug my devices when I'm not using them, and really conserve electricity. I also have the option through my electric company to choose green energy solutions, and that's actually what I do. Um, I'm telling the company through consumer choice to use more green alternatives. So it might be a nice exercise for you to do. This is an overview of some of the other environmental impacts of the mining industry, so you might want to take a look at this. There's too many to note, and it, and it just might be a nice exercise for you to look at. Okay, we're seeing a new type of mining occur, and it's beginning in what's called the tar sands of Alberta, Canada. And aside from open pit mining and strip mining, this is a little bit different uh, of a method and what we're mining in the tar sands of Alberta Canada is tar or oil this is a petroleum mine that the ore is an ore it's actually oil but it's mixed within the sand it's mixed within the soil itself um, in large quantities in Alberta Canada Canada has the largest deposits of oil in the world all right and they call them the tar sands but to mine the tar sand is extremely energy intensive. And we'll talk a lot about this topic in our energy unit, but I just want to show you this slide because this is a mine in Alberta, Canada in the tar sands. And it's not an open pit mine, it's not a strip mine, it is literally taking the land away and extracting the oil out of the sand. So you've literally 
taking the land away. I don't think there's a name for it yet. This is somewhat of a new industry that's exploding at the moment because of the United States' need for oil. Our consumption rates are always increasing, and Canada happens to be a neighbor. It's our largest supplier of oil. It is the reason why the Keystone XL pipeline was proposed. But this industry, this type of mining, is extremely environmentally destructive.